I heard the other day a uh, sales manager say, don't get on the roller coaster of sales. And I thought to myself, oh, that's good advice, but that's like um, <laughs> uh, any other advice. Don't eat food, exercise more. The problem in sales is it is a roller coaster. It's an emotional roller coaster, and there's a lot more downs than there are ups. And as salespeople, we have to adhere to that. We have to ride it because we're on it. And if we get off of it, then we're not making money. But when we're on it, we've got to be able to control our emotions, to stay focused, to stay energized. And that's what we're going to be talking to you about today. Uh, we've got an expert who's really focused on that part of it, that mindset, because we are human beings, no matter what our managers think <laughs> or our customers even. We have you know great days and bad days, and even within the day, we'll go up and down. And I've been victimized by this probably as much as anybody else. So we're going to talk to you. How do you stay focused? How do you stay motivated? How do you stay in the game without having the game run you over? This is a critical element of sales. It's something that uh, you know people talk a little bit about. And the idea of just grinding through it, uh, using willpower, uh, you know if that works for you. Uh, it, it works for a very short period of time. But we're Today, we're going to be talking about what works long term, because this is a key element, because if you stay in the sales game long enough, you're going to get good. You're going to make some money. You're going to have a lot of success. But if you you know, get scared, if you get burnt out real quickly, then, then you lose it and you miss out on all the great stuff that sales has to offer you. Uh, before we get in the interview, I want to make sure you're checking out CoVideo. Uh, the constant theme that I'm hearing from reps today is that video email is the key thing to break through. I'm including it in uh, the start the conversation, get the meeting as far as how to do it. I'm doing it. It's insanely effective. It's a way of connecting. If you've seen me on LinkedIn, I five dexed my video uh, views uh, because people are getting it. I, I come up with you know a little bit of an idea, a perspective, and I try and crack what the know-it-alls think they know it all about, like decision-making and authority, and understand how companies make decisions today. So check those out if you want a little uh, one-minute uh, pump in the arm every day. I also put them up on YouTube under Brian Burns Sales on YouTube. All the links are in the show notes. You got to learn how to see the show notes because I put all the gold there, everything that I can't talk to you uh, on the podcast. Also, make sure you're checking out Pipe Drive. They're just cooking. They're really expanding fast, and it's an enterprise quality CRM. So today you can have share your calendar with your clients as well as keeping all that email tracking. Uh, because when you look at your email, uh, I didn't get a reply. Was it the subject line? Was it the content? We don't know if we don't know if they opened it. So you get that built in. So you have your CRM, your contacts, your calendar, and your email and your pipeline all together. So that's how I crush it. Let's get into the interview. I have a big surprise for you at the end. So stay tuned. And here we go. Hey, Mike, thanks for joining us today. As a way of getting started, tell us about yourself. Uh, thank you, Brian. Well, I'm excited about being here. I've been in sales for a long time and last 30 years, been working with companies of all types around the world, over 130 countries, uh, to help them improve sales, service, and help managers coach more effectively. And how'd you get into that? Uh, actually, in college, I uh, grew up on a farm and got recruited to sell books door to door in my college summer. So I was a straight <laughs> commissioned salesperson, paid my way through college, had uh, over 600 salespeople at one point. Uh, right after I got out of college that I managed. And from there, just fell in love with selling. Yeah. Uh, I've been in all types of sales since then and and all types of organizations. Live here in Nashville, Tennessee. Well, what is it about Nashville? I, I find more consultants, trainers, thought leaders coming out of Nashville. There must be something in the water there. Uh, it must be the music or something. I don't yeah. know. It's growing <laughs> like crazy. Uh, over 100 people a day moving here right now. So it's a popular place. Well, you get the no state uh, sales tax or income tax, which is a mm -hmm. good draw. Yeah. And it's a beautiful city. Um, how about the airline the coverage? Is it getting better? Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, pretty centrally located. We've got lots of headquarters moving here, especially out of California and some of the high tax states. Yeah. Uh, 12,000 hotel rooms going up and uh, just 
friendly people and not just good music, but a lot of other industries too. Yeah. So what was it like selling books door to door? Were they encyclopedias or? No, it was actually, it's a, the oldest company in Nashville back in the mid 1800s. And they work with college students to sell books of all types and uh, sold uh, study books for kids and and um, home medical books and so forth is still around. Yeah. Uh, thousands of people have done it. And it was it was uh, building character in young people. So sure we learned how to build a business and relate to all kinds of people door to door. And and it's uh, some of those same principles are true today. And how did you get into consulting? What was the, the impetus for that? Uh, actually, Ron Willingham, who wrote the book that we uh, based a lot of our programs on, Integrity Selling, uh, approached us, and I went to his course, and I thought, you know, this really resonates with me yeah. because it's a very customer-focused process, not uh, not tricks and manipulation, but it's really a, a needs-based type of, of philosophy of selling. And you, you fell in love with it? We did, and then we started representing that program with all kinds of companies, and locally here, uh, individually with companies in Nashville, and then branched out nationally and now as I said we've trained several million people all over the all over the world yeah but about, about 3,000 different clients and, and your focus is it on coaching and mindset is that your passion or it is um, how, to, how to help salespeople improve their selling skills and then corresponding to that how to help managers draw more out of their people and how to develop develop them more effectively because, Brian, I see there's so many salespeople. You hire two pay people, and you think, boy, they're going to be great salespeople. Yeah, one succeeds, and one fails miserably. And managers always ask me, well, why is that? And it's, it's often they may have the same intelligence. They may have the same type of background, same potential. But often it's that drive. It's a sense of passion. It's the mindset that they have of what their job really is or sense of purpose that tends to be the differentiator between success and failure. So let's dig into it. Now, when you say purpose, is that like their why? Why are they doing mm -hmm. it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of it. Um, I mean, what am I really doing? Am I just selling a product? Yeah. Or am I focused on how can I create value for my customers? And am I focused on me and what I'm going to make? Or am I really focused on uh, my customers? Because I think customers can pick that up. As much as I grew up on a farm. And uh, I remember my dad saying, you need to be careful when you get in that hog pen because those animals can sense if you're afraid of them or not. <laughs> and my theory is that people can sense that too. People are at least that sensitive, just more, more so than animals. That they can tell if you're there to help them or if you're there to do something to them. And if they sense that you're really there with a sense of how can I create value and how can I do something that's a benefit, they tend to be more open to you and you sell more. Yeah, you because, know, you know, all the people I talk to, that why, that purpose, whatever word you select, having that be known mm -hmm. and articulated and uh, kind of even uh, reminded of every day, as opposed to the tactical commission check, uh, you know, just grind of a job. Well, that is so true that you really need to do it every day. Yeah. Because in sales, you know, we can get knocked down so many times. <laughs> really? And uh, <laughs> it's maybe many times every day. And sometimes it's tough. We had a, a client of had about 2,000 salespeople. And as the manager, the leader, he looked at what we called a sales congruence model of what his mindset was every day so that he would keep his focus properly in place because he knew that that would rub off on all of his people. And that's it. And as human beings, we're really not, uh, that doesn't come natural. Mm -hmm. um, I, I kind of made it a habit this year. Uh, I've got it in wonder list on my iPhone and every morning I bring it up, you know, my, my list of why I'm doing this. That, that is really – I'm a wonderless person myself too. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's a great little tool. Uh, yeah, I think as people keep that in front of them and they're thinking about, okay, when they hear that objection, instead of just giving in, they're going to think, okay, what's the value that I'm creating? What's this going to mean to people? We had one of our salespeople that was working with a pharmaceutical company, and he was talking about people's view of selling and do they view the, themselves as 
bothering people. In this case, this person was in the waiting room of a doctor, and she's thinking, oh, people are looking at me thinking, you're the reason healthcare is so expensive. You know, you're the reason I'm <laughs> yeah. late by appointment. Talk yourself up, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and they're thinking all this negative stuff. And the course that he was teaching, the person said, well, how do you solve that, that mindset issue? And somebody else said, well, here's what I did. Uh, the drugs that we work with help kids who have certain problems. And I went and went to a, a camp where the kids ride horses, and, they, and, we, and I saw what difference it made in these children's lives to have the, the pharmaceutical product that we sell and how their parents said it made such a difference. And it's just totally changed their life. So now whenever I go to a doctor, it's not I'm causing a problem or causing people to wait. It's I'm changing people's lives. So whatever it is, if we can think of the end result, what's the purpose of what I'm really doing for that customer? And what's the purpose of what I'm trying to do it can make a huge difference. And I've seen that pretty consistently because when you have like peer to peer selling, meaning somebody who's used the product or believes in the product. And, and I kind of lucked out in one of my first enterprise sales jobs was I was an engineer who used the product and I loved the product. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. And if you could get me in front of another engineer, uh, I could, we, we could just talk for hours about it because I could well, sh it, show the differences and yeah, they could sense your passion. You really believed in it. Oh, yeah. And people can tell whether you believe in what you're talking about or not. And it, and that really is a differentiator. If you've got a parity of product with a competitor, uh, I mean, do they, do they sense that you believe in the company that you represent? Not just the product, but also if everything's the same, even if it's not the same, I make the difference. Uh, that, that sense of passion comes through that I'm going to help you get the results that you that you need from this product or service. And do you do you find that approach of the either the product or the outcome or the meaning for the company compared to the meaning for the individual? Like I've certainly seen like a lot of people who have kids in private schools or or kids with special needs or you know a spouse with special needs. Those people just crush it. Mm -hmm. because they come in every day and they know why they're working hard. Well, if managers can help salespeople figure out what it, why are they really doing this? Uh, so many people get into sales, they never planned on it. They thought, I'm going to be a doctor, a lawyer, or something else. <laughs> yeah, that's usually but, well. <laughs> yeah, but i got to make some money. i got a car payment and kid yeah. payments and everything else. i gotta, I got to do something to make money and end up in sales. Uh, we were working with a with a call center group, and there was a young man who was who was really really hitting it, and we talked about what really drove him, and the deal was his wife, he was just newly married, his wife's parents didn't believe and were not real proud that their daughter had married a quote telephone salesperson, yeah. and his goal in life was to prove to his in laws. That, that their daughter made a wise decision with him because he was going to be very, very successful and provide well for her. Yeah. So he kept it in front of himself that he his clear purpose was there. Uh, so I think when people have that clear sense of why they're doing something and when managers have the relationship that they can help draw that out of people, people tend to really then crush it, like you said. And that's it. And I think you raised a great point because how do people end up in sales? And I always say it's one of two things, either uh, they're insanely money motivated or above averagely mm -hmm. money motivated, or they can't find anything else to do. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's typically it. So, you know, the money motivated one is pretty clear. You get a good comp plan and a good opportunity. They're happy. Uh, if they can't do anything else, then you've got to they've got to have a motive and it can't be just fear because fear certainly in sales is it's not a good long-term motivator. No, it's really not. And, and you can't blame people at times for having a poor view of selling, Yeah. especially if they got into sales and you know, didn't really plan on it from the beginning. Uh, we often say that there, there's three core critical conversations for success in sales. And one is obviously you need to, have a know how to have the conversation with the customer 
skill set of the sales process, how do you plan for a call, how do you move people towards for a decision, product knowledge. But there's a second conversation, Brian, that happens a whole lot more every day, and that's the one that's going on in the salesperson's head. It's a conversation with themselves and what they're saying about what they can and can't do. You know, I, you know, I'm sure they're, they're kind of busy. I can't call them right now. Oh, it's lunchtime. Oh, it's too late in the day. Or yeah. I could never call on these people. Or they're higher up than I am. And all the junk that's in the head that's holding people back from being more successful. And the third conversation is the one with the manager. And do you have a relationship with the manager that can help you think through this and help develop both the skill set and the mindset for success? And how do you hire to this? Uh, especially in this world today where unemployment's at, you know, super low levels. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people have all kind of generational uh, predispositions. And, you know, when the money motivated person comes in, you know, the competitive person, ex-military, ex-athlete, um, who's super competitive, you see it, you see the fire in their eyes and you have a comfort that they're going to do well. But then you get, uh, you know, the anthropology graduate who, you know, wants the job, who's super smart, but, you know, th th money isn't the primary motive. Mm -hmm. I mean, do, do you hire those people or do you? Well, I think <clears throat> it's not a not an open and shut answer, but yeah. I think you, you, I've seen some people with you know, philosophy degrees and religion and psychology degrees do very well. Uh, they didn't plan on getting into sales, but you tap into something that it's either the product that you're selling that really lights their fire, that passion that you talked about, or you help them see something they can accomplish for themselves that they can't do anyplace else. Yeah. And and a lot of that is a quality of the interview that the manager has with them um, and, and to position what you're really doing. If, if people see a sense of purpose, you take that philosophy major that that really maybe wants to make a difference but can't make any money doing it, and now and, and now they see they can make a difference in life. Uh, a quick example, we had an uh, insurance company we're working with, and uh, in Texas we had a salesperson who was a former school teacher. And uh, no way he wanted to be in sales, but he couldn't pr provide college education for his kids. Yeah. So he got an insurance and he was failing and uh, he was thinking about himself and how much money he was making and how he wasn't doing well and how he didn't want to make calls. And so the manager was able to sit down and, and help shift his mindset to think instead of thinking about himself to really focus on the values creating for his clients and how he was changing their lives and provided for their kids college education, helping them uh, put away for retirement, whatever it might be. And when he shifted that mindset, the guy's call calls went up four times, and all of a sudden he became successful within was, was hitting success within about six months instead of going out the door as a failure. So I think you can hire those folks, but you've got a sense that they've got to they've got to have a real purpose of of why they'd want the job. Yeah, they've got they've got to be teachable, uh, and they've got to be willing to work hard. And let's talk about that coachability, because that is probably number one or number two when I interview sales leaders of what they mm -hmm. want in somebody, especially an entry level or first year rookie in sales. Um, because it's so easy to get into a rut or, you know, shoot from the hip. Mm -hmm. And if people are sensitive <laughs> or, or kind of don't like feedback and i think out of getting feedback and being coachable is something you have to have grown up with i think yeah either through being a musician or an athlete or somewhere some place where you were constantly getting feedback and saw that as a positive thing i think a lot of that too is the kind of relationship the manager develops with the rep um does the rep see the manager as someone who's there for them yeah. or there to simply criticize and beat them up. <laughs> um, we had a man. <laughs> I'm not going to tell them anything positive. They already know they're positive. So I'm going to tell them how to, you know, where they're screwing up. Yeah. <laughs> and, and most people don't want to get beat up like that. Uh, so if the manager can build a trusting relationship, 
Uh, that's a key thing. Number two is that person does need to be coachable. Um, and perhaps it's, it's taking little bite-sized pieces at a time that the manager doesn't, doesn't try to change them overnight with everything, just picks one or two things. Yeah. We typically teach them just focus on one core thing that can be a leverage point uh, to help the person when you're coaching them, not just not whole laundry list of types of things. And are you finding kind of uh, managers becoming uh, dashboard jockeys today versus uh, certainly when I got into sales, it was much more interaction. Uh, there, there was some coaching. And then then it, I think after about 10 years, it turned into carrot and stick. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, well, which, uh, uh, absolutely. I think some of the tools we've got that are really great, like Salesforce and other apps, can be a positive, but they can also turn into we're just talking about numbers and details instead yeah. of really coaching people. Uh, when we're coaching, we're talking about how do you develop people? Uh, how do you ask the right questions? How do you find out what, what is motivating them? Most people, if we had a flip chart here, Brian, and we could, let's say, put an X in the middle, and that's you or me or any salesperson, and out on the outer part, let's put a bunch of dots in kind of a circle, and each of these dots stand for our beliefs. Uh, how much money I think I can make, who I think I can call on, kind of house I want to live on, live in. We've got hundreds and thousands of these things, big and small, we've developed over our lifetime. And if we could connect those dots into a circle, inside that is our comfort zone. And all of our actions, feelings, behaviors, and abilities are bounded by that. So the manager, through through questioning, through observation in the field, if he or she can see what is that comfort zone, and help the person set goals right outside it, not so far out that they don't believe it, but right outside it, then help them put a plan in place to hit it, they can bit by bit develop that person to expand their beliefs to be more successful. Uh, We we did a a study last year, a global study on coaching, and it was really kind of interesting that there's over 200 companies around the world, sales leaders, and 76% of them said coaching is critical for our success. But almost an equal number, three quarters of them said, "Eh, but we don't do much coaching. (laughs) Right. And those that did, over half the time, they said it wasn't effective. Yeah. Uh, And half the managers never been trained how to coach. So it really is a leverage point to be able to teach managers how to develop their people uh, because they're the leverage point in, in the organization. That's it. And a pipeline review is not coaching. No, I mean, that's important. We're not, yeah. I don't want to put that do down. Yeah. You got to do it. Um, but if you can help light that fire under people and, and understand what their why is and yeah. help them focus on how they're making a difference, that tends, especially with millennials today, they, all the studies say that they want a stronger sense of purpose. Well, sales is a great place to be for them. Yeah. And I think, Everybody does, and I think what people misunderstand about millennials is that all of us, when we were in our twenties, were like that. It's mm-hmm. just we called exactly. it something else, called it hippies, we called it a grunge, we called it something different. And then this thing happens when you become thirty: is you buy a house, you get married, and all of a sudden you get kids and two car payments, and you've got enough motivation. It's funny. I was reading something the other day that. It was from the Roman times and 2,000 years ago, and, and the guy was complaining about young people today. They didn't have the right work ethic. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that's just a generational thing. Yeah, we just forget. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I was talking about somebody whose son wants to go into the military, and he's just shaking his head. And I'm like, don't you remember what it was like to be 17, 18? Yeah. I mean, I mean we should be really handcuffed for at least four years <laughs> before we let go of <laughs> society. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And, you know, science has proven that, that the frontal lobe isn't developed until like 24, 25. And it's just part of being young. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now, if you have a good why, I mean, how do you build that into a habit? Because too many people, I think, talk about goals. And I don't have nothing against goals, but goals is like a quarterly, annual thing where your why and your habits are daily. Yes. I think it's something you've got to keep in front of you all the time. Of Because w- with all the ups and downs, you've got to yeah. understand what's my personal why and what's the difference I'm making for customers. Uh, no matter what you're selling, 
there's there's benefits you're creating for customers and whether it's individuals or for uh, companies or whatever it is uh, and if you keep that in front of you that'll help with with the with those ups and downs and that's it because I, I made it a separate list which were kind of uh, you know three to five year objectives exciting mm-hmm. things that um, keep you going and what your and what your end objective is uh, while you you have your why every day because I think Unlike any other profession, sales is a roller coaster. And, it is. Yeah. And it, how, how do you coach managers on you know making the lows recoverable? Well, um, <laughs> they've got those uh, they've got those ups and downs too. Yeah, sure uh, do. And too often, a manager ends up being a super rep, you know, jumping in there and doing the business for the rep instead of. Uh, letting letting that person fail and, and help them coach them. Um, I think a lot of it's sensitivity. It's, it's asking questions. Too many times managers want to be the expert. Yeah. If they can develop more of their questioning skills and listening skills for what's that person really saying and also develop an environment uh, where that rep will trust them. Too many times managers don't get the truth. No, uh, no. And if they don't get the truth from the people, they can't really coach them properly. Uh, so the trusting relationship is critical. So that, so if you're vulnerable, the rep can be vulnerable and say, hey, here's where I'm struggling. Uh, and if you can get to that point, all of a sudden that person is more open to your, to your suggestions. That's it. I, I go into accounts and I see too many people playing office space where mm-hmm. the reps are telling the managers what they want to hear. The managers are comfortable until the you know that the truth comes out. Typically, the end of the month, end of the quarter, and then there's all those finger pointing, explanations, uh, you know, redefining losing a deal is no decision. Um, so much game playing. It it is, and I think most of the studies are showing that less than fifty percent of people today are hitting their quota. And it's one of the lowest percentages since studies have been going on in that area. Uh, so, you know, just beating people up, just talking about the deal is not going to get it anymore. It's, <laughs> no, it's, it's got to go deeper. Yeah, because the, the beating up, you get a knee-jerk reaction and you'll get immediate response. But long-term, it's not a strategy. Yeah. Um, well, I think you taught, you said, said it before. You've got to have long-term goals. You've got to have... Do you, do you know what that person wants to make money for? Yeah. Um, as a manager, do I know that, that this person wants to prove in that past case to their in-laws? Do I know that they want to pay for college education for their kids? Uh, we had a, a manager who was, who was uh, having a struggle with one of his uh, – it was a car salesperson, actually. And this guy was close to retirement. He'd been selling, you know, high numbers for a long time, and now he's just barely selling a couple cars a month, and he had plenty of money. So he was at the manager started asking him what about his situation. He realized that his daughter had married someone who wasn't making much money, and he was concerned that his grandson couldn't go to college. So he redirected his purpose from making money for himself to making money for his grandson's college. Yeah. And you know, overnight, bang, his car sales went up. So, so part of that's having the relationship that they can trust you. You can find out what the truth is and then help tie what you're doing into what they want to accomplish. Cool. Hey, this has been a lot of fun, Mike. Where do people go to learn more about you and your work and connect with you? Uh, It's been fun for me too. We're Integrity Solutions. So if you go to www.integritysolutions.com, you can learn about what we do to help improve sales, service, and coaching skills and be delighted. There's all kinds of free things on there. We've got podcasts and webinars and ebooks and so forth. Uh, feel free to call us or write us and be glad to help answer any questions you might have and be delighted to help. 
So what we need to do is build up that why. Why are we doing this? And then when we hit the bottom of the roller coaster to ask ourselves, why are we doing this? And if your why isn't big enough, it isn't very apparent, what ends up happening is we focus on the bad. And then we go into a downward spiral. And some people I've seen go so far down the spiral that they can never get back up. They lost their why or they never had it. And the why, you know, money is one thing and it'll get you pretty far. But what I've found with money is you always have, it keeps getting bigger. If it's this, then it's twice that, then it's twice that again. And that snowball never really gets achieved. What I've seen work really well for people is when it's about somebody else, kids, charity, something that's bigger than ourselves, bigger than things. Now, if things do it for you, don't let me stop you because things can be a lot of fun. Experiences can be a lot of fun. Whatever turns you on, that's what matters. It's finding that and remembering it and also being grateful for what you have. Because just, I mean, think back one year, five years, 10 years ago and where you were then and see how far you've come. Have little memories of what you're looking, f- what you accomplished in the past and what you're looking forward to do in the future. A lot of people think goals will do it and you know if goals would do it for you. Uh, you know, because here we are, uh, you know, near the end of Q1 and I got a big surprise for you. I'm holding the prices, the Q1 prices, to the last day of March, March 31st. So if you sign up for the courses by March 31st, you'll lock in not only the Q1 price, because I held it, everyone's busy, kickoff, conferences. I know, I know. Who has time to sell when all this stuff is going on? But also, I'm throwing in a coupon code that will give you 100% off the selling questions at sell course. Now that course is just cooking it right now because people are getting a way of controlling the sales conversation instead of being whipped around about what's your price and ah, we're not interested. All of this mind control that we can have with the questions that sell, understanding the psychological steps that people go through and how to keep them focused on what you want them focused on instead of you being subservient to them. You have control over the sales conversation. So make sure you go and check it out at b2brevenue.com under training. Go right to the courses, sign right up. If you have questions about them, Uh, You can listen to the podcast. I talk about it all the time. Some people say I talk too much. But you can call me. uh, Basically, get on my calendar. We have a 15-minute call. We talk about what you're up against. Are you trying to get into new accounts? Are you trying to get deals done faster, get deals done bigger, have more control over them? I'm doing a lot of videos over it. Everybody thinks they're talking to the decision maker. Guess what? There's more than one decision, and there's more than one decision maker. And if you're talking to one person, that means you're not talking to all the decision makers. So go check that out at b2brevenue.com. I also got a free ebook there. All you have to do is put your email address in, and it sends you a link to the ebook. Are you checking out the other podcasts? Are you? Sales questions, brutally honest answers. Also, B2B. Uh, revenue leadership. I, I talked to great sales leaders, marketing leaders, and you got to understand how a company operates and how you can influence it. Really appreciate everybody listening. Uh, follow me on LinkedIn. If you see one of my videos go by, uh, give it a little thumbs up. I'd be really appreciative of that. I also have a company page on LinkedIn for all the podcasts where I put funny videos and uh, give you little tips on how to do video emailing, how to use pipe drive to just crush it. And are you checking out Gong's blog? Our buddy over at Gong is just crushing it with research. I've been using Gong now for about three months on my interviews. I'm learning a lot about my style and my communication skills are developing. I don't know if you've noticed. Appreciate everybody listening. We'll see you next time.